Let's hit the other New York team. Um, and I don't know how you let me have this one since I consider you the Knicks authority. Um, so here's my, my sort of overarching Knicks take, and we can get into more details from here. And you Hold tell on, me you descend into existential crisis really quickly. Yeah, no. Well, you yeah. tell me if you disagree. I think basically the Knicks are a team in need of a player that's better than everyone they have, maybe two. Um, and they actually are in possession of asset wise, like what it would take under you know normal circumstances to get someone like that. You know, there are salaries to move, they have their picks, uh, and they have some extra picks. And like it's so it's just sort of like well then just go get us there aren't there just aren't stars there aren't stars that are reasonably available at prices you should pay right now it doesn't seem like um, so first of all is that like is that off base that like the need is clear and the path to filling that need is also pretty clear it's just the it's we're in the wrong reality because the the piece the guy they need just isn't available right yeah I'd agree with you I would also question though whether they actually have enough assets to get it done at this okay. point because you look at the first round picks they have where I guess if you're looking at their own into the future, those will have value to teams but like the Mavericks one is going to convey this year outside the lottery. Probably you don't know when Detroit or Washington or if Detroit or Washington yeah. picks are going to convey. Now you're getting to a point where quickly about to be on his next deal. Ditto for top in. Cam Reddish, the restricted free agent this summer, has no value. You've paid R.J. Barrett, who's not having a good year, especially on defense. It's like, how flat? who are they outbidding, honestly, at this point? Like, what is their best? They, they could outbid. This is not like the Lakers, where their offer is so rigid. But I don't think that the Knicks is... Like, they have Quentin Grimes. Like, he's very interesting. And again, having all your own first-round picks. But I just think they're flat. And it doesn't matter, because that market doesn't exist right now. But if right. you're going into the star trade market now or this summer... I don't think the Knicks' best offer carries as much weight as it did this past summer when you still had two years left for Toppin and quickly and R.J. Barrett hadn't signed his extension yet. A lot of the sheen, I think, is worn off of the Knicks' best blockbuster package. Well, so then do you think... So it seems like the the plan, the ideal for them is we're going to hold on to our picks and these other ones, which I agree. Like I, The Dallas one... Probably, you know, that's it's not going to be valuable. It's going to convey this year, I assume. Um, and then the Detroit and Washington ones combined because of all the protections are kind of like, yeah, it's two firsts, but it's really like it's really like 0.75 firsts just because of what they're likely to be valued at. So, but do you think the current tact, which seems to be we're going to hold on to these and use a bunch of them in one big deal? which is what I just said they should do at some point when that becomes a good option is better than, well, let's go Evan Fournier and like a real first for Buddy Heald, or let's like, you know, package some other picks with like some combination of Fournier, Rose, Cam Reddish, whatever for another, a big contract coming back. Like I've seen Gordon Hayward thrown out there, which is like, I mean, I guess it'd be cool to have a $30 million salary <laughs> slot filled, but like, I don't want to give up a pick just so I can hope to trade this guy in another deal that I give up picks in a year if from you're, now. Why, why would they ever give up a pick for Gordon Hayward? Who are they getting off? Like Gordon Hayward's deal is well, worse than any other contract on the roster. <laughs> I, I don't know. I'm just, I've seen that out there. Um, I think Fred Katz was talking about Hayward as, as an option. So, do, so back to the question, like, do you think it makes more, so I, I take it as you would not be in favor of let's kind of split these up and think about let's move this pick with a bad contract for a good player. Who's not a star, obviously like healed is just the guy I'll use or, or is it better to just let's hold on to these and wait for, I don't know, Carl Anthony towns or like whoever else becomes, you know, available for a bunch of picks at some point. No, I'd be in favor of splitting. Like if it's a, I wouldn't do it for a buddy, but like a Malik Beasley or a Gary Trent jr. If that's the okay. route you go. I would be in favor of that. I was going to ask though, this is like a player who falls, I think smack dab in the middle of the line. You're trying to straddle right now. They've been linked to OG Ananobi right. and the reports are that they've offered three first round picks for OG Ananobi. Now my guess would be that two of them are from this year and that kind of dilutes the value. But let's just say if they're willing to give up two of their own, like 
I don't even know how to like if they're willing to give up three first round picks and and let's say a real player here where it's quickly or it's topping or even if it's I would it's not going to be Grimes. But like if they're willing to go up three first round picks, that young player, and then salary filler, Derek Rose, whatever they Evan, if they're getting off Evan Fournier in the process, even better. Is that a move you're making, knowing as we talked about off air that if OG Ananobi is in fact unhappy in Toronto, it's in part because he wants a larger offensive role. Right. So Ananobi. So let's say I'll, I'll answer your question with another question. Like if if all three of those firsts that you know, are incoming, the Dallas, Detroit, and Washington ones are in there. And then you add two of your own, like unprotected future firsts. So you're re- it's sort of like the optics five. are, it's That's five really firsts. Great. It's really not five firsts, but I mean, it is and it isn't. To me, I think I do that if I'm the Knicks, just, you know, if you can get some protections on your actual firsts. Wait, wait I'm sorry. You would give up five first round picks for OG Ananobi, or let's say four. They're not real firsts though. These, uh, these other, the, the Dallas one is, but then the, the Washington and Detroit ones are, are like fake. I mean, firsts. Detroit's gets down to top nine protection in 2027. That's, I mean, it's 2027. But that doesn't mean <laughs> that it's a fake first round. This isn't the Hornets pick. That That's they, true. That's true. Pick. I'm overstating it. Okay. But you're about to have, you know, how the Pelicans and Nuggets fans have gone at you and you do. You're about to have Knicks fans go at you too. <laughs> That's fine. It's a, they're fake firsts. Um, <laughs> <I, laughs> no, but your question is is the, the valid one, which is is Ananobi going to get what he wants? with the Knicks in terms of his role and should he in terms of like expanding his offensive game? Cause like there's no scenario where you don't want him as a defensive piece. It's just like, he's about as good as it gets in terms of plug and play, like universal applicability He could guard five positions. That's, that's great. Um, Like you could make the case. He's the best three and D player in the league. Maybe like with just real emphasis on the defense. I don't know about how much I trust him as an offensive piece. Anyway, um, cause then you're going to have to deal with his next contract. So if like you give up all that stuff, let's say it's not five, let's say it's like two real ones, two real firsts, which I'm even saying if it's three, I just don't know how you got to five. That was no, just, I was just trying to, try, trying to excite you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> like that's a lot to give up for a guy that you're not totally sure is going to sort of play the way you hope he plays. And that as a result of that might just not want to stay with your team like in pretty short order. So that's the real scary part for Ananobi, but without there being a star out there, like a real, you know, best player on the team star, I guess that's kind of what your target ought to be. Um, I just, you have it's, to, hard, it's hard to know how likely that is right now. I don't know what I would do. I probably wouldn't do it just because I don't think that I'd be worried about him leaving. Right. Uh, and the other thing is just like, if you get him, you're kind of at a point where it's okay. Like you need to move RJ Barrett to the bench or get rid of RJ Barrett if you're at that, but because I just, I like, look, you're going to play with all three of Barrett, Randall and Brunson. Then he's never going to get any sort of additional offensive touches. Yeah. So you could bring RJ off the bench, but also it's just, I, 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 you could keep all of them. I'm just saying like, there would have to be some sort of a call made. I think on RJ, cause you're not benching Julius Randall at this point. you definitely can't bench Jalen Brunson. Who's your best player. So I like, it's just, it's weird is all this. And I could think of very few teams that are worse or less equipped to give OG Ananobi a more prominent offensive role. If he's yeah. traded there, where are you on Barrett real quick? Just like, what is Barrett going to be in your estimation? I'm all over the place. I've, I've shifted yeah. from like highs and lows on him. I, I do think part of it is just like the offensive hierarchy is not built to let him develop. Like, I think some of his best minutes have come when he's playing with the bench, which speaks to like how much he might need the ball to experiment mm-hmm. at the same time. Like his standstill shooting is kind of settled in at points. The defense has been just god awful at stages this year. I don't know what he is. I do lean more towards this is someone who might be like a like an average NBA player or worse long term. But like that's just me kind of living in the moment, having just watched him like get cooked against yeah. the Lakers and not play. Right? I mean, I think they played down the stretch. Yeah, they they did bench him. I had to go back and watch that game, but it was there was down the stretch they benched him, and yeah. I like, and you know. A Tibbs is part of the problem in New York, but like the defense RJ was playing that game. I'm sort of just like, yeah, like I, I don't really blame him. And look, those, those instances are going to be probably like 
higher if you have OG Ananobi on your team and you want Quentin Grimes' defense and you know you're playing Brunson and Randall already. So it's just OG Ananobi is such a complicated fit for the Knicks. I do think Knicks fans don't know. No, I don't want to paint a sweeping brush, but some they've seemed insulted that they would give up three first round picks for OG Ananobi. Like, if, yeah, if it's three unprotected picks, it's 25, 27, and 29 of your own. Yes, I get it. But like OG Ananobi is good. And I saw some people push me like, well, why would we ever give up Toppin for OG Ananobi? Like, fucking stop. Obi Toppin is barely playing. Yeah. The Knicks only view him as this one position player. Won't play with Julius Randle. I just can't. It's this time of year where I, tr- I usually don't get frustrated with fan bases, but fan bases' propensities were just completely irrationally overvaluing their own talent and devaluing everyone else's is just brain bending to me. Yeah, it's hard. I mean, like, you, if you only watch the Knicks or you mostly watch the Knicks, like, oh, Toppin can really get out and run and he's shooting threes well. It's just like the theory of Toppin as like a starting level player, just th- the best version of that does not come close to what Ananobi has been over the last couple of and years. And the other thing is just like, it doesn't, I actually think Obi Toppin could start. It's yeah. not happening in New York. Yeah. And so it's just like, what, so yeah, but that's just, I don't, I don't know where I land on the Ananobi. It depends on the picks, but I just feel like it, it could create, like extra layers of confusion as to what the hell's going like that's the player where it's i don't really know what they're committing towards where like we'll get to the trade idea i have where it's very much like okay maybe we get better for this season and like things are still very fluid but now like you've kind of committed to ananobi and what's the long-term fit there when you're paying him it it's a weirdly high An- ananobi is a weirdly high risk player for the Knicks, given his profile for, yeah. for all the reasons we talked, which like, it doesn't make sense that a guy who should fit absolutely anywhere based on his track record is actually like, well, I don't know. I don't know if that's going to work there, which is, it's a, that's a weird kind of thing to try to juggle. What's your, what's your trade though, before we get to Ananobi's Raptors who are just like the biggest swing team in the, in the whole league. Yeah. So by the way, I have their toughest player to move is Fournier. And also the most likely player to be traded is definitely Cam Reddish, right? Uh, yeah, reddish for sure. Fournier, man, how, how, how does it, how does a deal go from like, that's, that's, that's reasonable to just awful. I would just like to point out, first of all, and I think we had a conversation that it wasn't reasonable because what team was giving him a third guaranteed year? Well, yeah, yeah, that's true. So he would have won the press conference had it been a three year deal. Didn't need to be a four year deal. I stand by that. Uh, (laughs) so the trade I have for them is the Knicks get Josh Hart and Justice Winslow for Isaiah Hartenstein and Cam Reddish. Uh, it doesn't have to be Justice Winslow if if the Blazers say, well, when he's healthy, he's too important to our bench. The Knicks could take whoever in that scenario. And they'll t- take, like, that was just to make the salaries even more even. Portland straddling a very close luxury tax line, but they need uh, a backup big, and I think Hart's not be good for them. You take a flyer on Reddish, and it's clear to me that Josh Hart is not going to be there next season. He's a player option. He's bound to decline. And so the Knicks get someone who can defend rebound well can play some up to small ball four if you want him to when Julius Randall isn't on the court although like you know between Toppin and Randall those minutes won't necessarily be available it was just like and then you could see maybe you resign him maybe you don't yeah I think I think I'm disappointed that I like this for the Knicks just because I I think we both thought Hartenstein was such a good signing um and he's been good since Robinson went out but just like it's not he's not a Tibbs big and if you're gonna play that way and when Mitchell Robinson comes back, I think he's going to be marginalized even further. Yeah, I mean it is a rental because Hart, for sure, I agree, is going to is not going to pick up that player option. He'll he can he'll resign somewhere for multiple years, probably at at least the twelve that he's that he's making. Um, I do think too, just the Portland side of this is if you get Hartenstein in the fold, then you know a lot of people think Yusuf Nurkic is the weak link there, and you can look to move him. And then maybe that's a way. I don't know who's buying. I was gonna say, I don't know who wants three years yeah. and fifty-five plus million of use of Nurkic. Right. He's that's, like a good player, same. but not one you get excited about. Right. It would just at least kind of like play into a broader theory of why Portland would do this. Um, just in case they can move him, then you have a you have like a guy. You know, Hardenstein can start. I think he's it's not a high end starter, but he's not making. If you high-end actually like run stuff for him as opposed to trying to use him as right. predominantly a rim roller, then yeah. I think he would be a good fit. 